so today we'll have uh, Benjamin uh, Villalonga presenting on quantum circuit simulation. And I'll go ahead and let him get started. Thanks. So um, thanks, Edgar. So first, uh, I want to make uh, a two-minute um, raise an issue. So uh, Professor Iquist called my attention on, on the use of the term quantum supremacy that, you know, not, not intentionally um, has, has offended a few people in the community, a few or many, I, I don't know personally. And, and this has been an issue in the past, and there's articles about this and so on. So, um, so my intention is not to get political and also not to, to offend anyone. So, so after thinking about it and, and also talk to the people at Google with, who, with whom I've worked, and they told me that they are also discussing changing the name. Uh, so I decided to, um, to use for, for this talk um, every time uh, you hear the, the phrase strong quantum advantage, I, I mean what we meant by quantum supremacy. And some people have, have, have suggested to use the term just quantum advantage, and some people refuse because that means something slightly different. So, so, so by quantum supremacy, and this is the last time I'll, I'll say it, uh, we mean really uh, solving a problem by a quantum computer that is fundamentally harder for the classical computer than for the quantum computer. So, so really it's a problem that lives outside of, of P as a complicated class and lives inside of BQP. That is what a quantum computers can, can solve quickly. Um, but quantum advantage uh, is sort of a weaker um, requirement of just doing better than the classical computer, but not, not in this very fundamental and deep way. So from now on, I'm going to use strong quantum advantage um, a few times uh, in my talk. Then also I realized uh, that I made this slide so quickly that I forgot to put affiliations, but actually I'm going to justify this by, by saying that right now I'm not employed by anyone. I, I just finished my PhD and I'm starting uh, at Google at the quantum team uh, in a month. So, so this is work I've done uh, both at Illinois and also at a couple internships at NASA and Google with the quantum computing teams that have been working on this experiment for, for some time. Um, let's get started. Okay, so I'm gonna divide the talk in two parts. Uh, the first part is just an overview of the experiment and really is kind of a no, no question part of the talk, a no question talk, where I'm gonna give some flavor of what um, this experiment was about and what the different uh, subtleties were. And in part two, I'm gonna talk more about the simulation side, which is very important uh, for the entire experiment and is actually where I've worked uh, the most. Okay, so for part one, let's start with the sort of mandatory, but every time shorter uh, introduction of why quantum computers might be useful in the future. So, so what is the promise that quantum computers might uh, deliver sometime? And, and quickly, what happens when you study quantum systems or systems that cannot be understood without quantum physics is that when you try to simulate them in order to understand the properties with what we call typical classical computers, uh, things get complicated very quickly. And by that mean, we mean that when you try to simulate a system, uh, you take this as a, as a problem that you want to simulate. It, as you increase the size of the problem, the scaling of your computational resources is not good at all. So the memory you need, the time you need, it really blows up exponentially. So we conclude very quickly when we get involved in these kind of studies that classical computers are very inefficient in simulating quantum systems. But the upside of, we can flip this uh, statement around and actually ask uh, whether we can build um, a computer that works in a fundamentally quantum way that can take advantage of this uh, fundamentally different uh, way of processing information and give us speed up some problems that were outside of our reach. So this is great. We have been talking about this for before I was born, um, but still they don't deliver. So, so a question that naturally arises is when will we have a demonstration that really a quantum computer is doing something like a classical computer is not, is not able to do? And, and not only that, but at a fundamental level, when will we see in practice that a quantum computer is solving something outside of the class of problems that classical computers can solve in polynomial time or quickly? Um, <clears throat> and most concerning is the question of whether this will ever happen at all. And there is a, a community of people that think that this will be impossible, that the noise that nature um, it puts into the system that we try to control is so large that fundamentally we will never 
be able to control uh, quantum systems in a way that you can, we can we can process information uh, without errors, and and so we will never have useful quantum information. So quantum computation. So that's why the experiment of you know, to demonstrate a strong quantum advantage is really important, not only as a stepping stone towards uh, on, on the way towards a fully scalable and error corrected quantum computer, but also as a proof of principle that quantum computers work. I'm sorry about this. Um, that quantum computers work and that they can do it in a fundamentally better way than a classical computer. So in order to demonstrate that, what people have been wondering about is what kind of problem we can find that is really hard for a classical computer so that you know lives outside of the class of problems that classical computers can solve easily, that is easy or natural for a quantum computer. Use in solving a problem with a quantum computer that you cannot solve with a classical computer, if no, if you will never know whether the solution was correct. The quantum computer did what it had to do. So the cartoon we have to keep in mind for this kind of demonstration is the following. So we talked already about the scaling of some kind of problems, um, you know, computational resources that you need to solve some kind of problems with a classical computer. So we have to find a problem where that is the case, but also at the same time, the quantum computer can solve it um, and the scaling of computational resources is much smoother, it's actually polynomial. Um, the, at the time that we demonstrate that, that there is enough separation, um, that we achieve a problem size that we can solve with a quantum computer, we have enough separation in between the two scalings, uh, we said we, we achieve strong quantum advantage, and, and actually we need to give enough buffer here in case something goes wrong and, and classical computers start catching up. Um, so does the demonstration of strong quantum advantage have to be useful? The answer is no. It's just a proof of principle. It is much easier to, to prove this or to demonstrate this without a useful problem and it will be actually pretty hard for the next years to find a useful strong quantum advantage. So it is expected that classical computers will fight back and will try to keep solving problems in more and more efficient ways. So we expect classical algorithms, classical algorithms and classical hardware to really push down this curve that is telling us about the computational resources that classical computers need. But actually the, the problem in, uh, to demonstrate quantum advantage or strong quantum advantage is designed so that classical computers will never get rid of this exponential scaling. So you can push down the curve all you want, but it's really a matter of improving the quantum computer a little bit and, and it being able to solve uh, problems a little bit larger in order to, to kick the classical computer again out of, of, the, of its comfort zone of what, what it can solve. So what problem uh, did the people at Google, the, the quantum team before I was involved in all of this, designed in order to, to demonstrate a strong quantum advantage? So the problem is called random circuit sampling and I'll try to give a flavor of uh, why it has all the ingredients that we need in order to demonstrate this uh, and what the actual task is. So um, as the word says, uh, first we have to generate a random quantum circuit. So a quantum circuit is you know, a set of instructions that the quantum computer will run. We generate a random for different reasons that hopefully become clear as we keep going. Um, and by random, of course, you can sample in many ways from the world or from the set of quantum computers we mean a hard random. So um, the hard measure in the, in the set of operators is sort of a fair measure where each unitary operator or each quantum circuit is evenly sampled. It's sampled with even probability. And then once we have a random quantum circuit, we're gonna run it with our quantum computer. This is the cartoon we use for our quantum computer. The quantum computer is gonna give, um, every time we run it, an, out an output that is a bit string. In practice, we're gonna get of the order of millions of them. And then the, the um, verifier, what it's going to do is test the output. And it's going to decide whether the output came from the right probability distribution. Did the quantum computer do the right thing? And are you solving the problem of sampling from the right random quantum circuit or no? Do you, are you trying to, to fool the verifier? And the verifier tells you, okay, you're not really sampling from the right distribution. Or did the quantum computer try, but you know the fidelity was so low that it 
didn't do it correctly. And of course, we have the classical competitor that is gonna try to do the same thing. It's gonna try to impersonate the quantum computer and fool the verifier into, try, into thinking that uh, it is a quantum computer. So, so the classical computer is gonna have a hard time in doing this. Um, in order to test whether the output is the correct one, we're gonna rely on classical simulation. So we have to simulate what the quantum computer is doing and then do some cross check of the, of the answer. We, we assume that the classical computer is doing the right thing. We've been using them for decades. So uh, we, with the right answer coming from the classical computer, we're gonna check that the quantum computer did the right thing. The mathematical test in order to do this is called cross-entropy benchmarking. And I'll explain in a second. So as you can see, this problem has all the ingredients we need. It is a natural problem for a quantum computer. It's, all it's doing is being a quantum computer, it's, it's running a quantum circuit. It's really hard, and we're gonna have more insight on this later for the classical computer to keep up. And we do have a way to verify the, the answer. We have some mathematical test that tells us whether the quantum computer or the classical computer that is impersonating the quantum computer is doing the right thing. Uh, this was proposed in 2016 in this, uh, in this paper. Uh, although the idea that quantum, strong quantum advantage was gonna be demonstrated through sampling, through sampling problems, was in the air for about a decade. So <clears throat> let me give uh, some details on the different steps that I just described. The first step was to generate a random quantum circuit. And the way uh, we did this in practice was the following. So this is a top view of the qubits that were used in this experiment uh, on some chip called Sycamore. There are 53 qubits, this one here was dead, so it wasn't used. And we can really put uh, two qubit gates between nearest neighbors and try to back this with two qubit gates or one qubit gate. So the way the random component circuits are gonna work is the following. The architecture or where the gates are is gonna be fixed. So they are just gonna be placeholders. So we're gonna iterate over different cycles of two qubit gates, one qubit gate, then a two qubit gate, then a one qubit gate and so on and keep iterating until you get as many cycles as you want. Um, the two qubit gates for this particular chip were called uh, FSIM, and they are these parameterized gates. And in practice, <clears throat> you can modify your parameters as you will. You, you explore some part of the space of, of unitaries for two qubits. And in particular, uh, the people at Google used uh, this gate called Sycamore, which has these two angles for theta and phi. The reason for that is that they found uh, best fidelity at that point, um, and there is no deeper implications there. The kind of gates that they use are universal, so it doesn't really matter for the claim of you know, building a quantum circuit that is built out of universal gates and is scalable and so on. No deeper implication for using this gate. But the, the parameterized gate, the space of parameterized gates, actually includes uh, pretty famous gates like the control Z, or actually a lot of control faces, uh, square of I swap, I swap, and swap. And then the randomness here, <clears throat> as I said, is not on the two qubit gates, is not on the architecture, it's gonna be on the white qubit gates. So every time you have to put a one qubit gate, you throw a die, and you decide which one of these three gates you're gonna put there. So, so if, you, if you realize these two gates here are Clifford, but this one is not, and that's really gonna make it hard for, for some naive simulators to keep up. Uh, this way of sampling, this way of generating random quantum circuits is actually, of course, not exploring the whole space of unitaries for a particular number of cycles, but it's actually discretizing that space. So this is a discretized version of, of generating random quantum circuits through the hard measure. So now uh, there is a task. Now we, we have a random quantum circuit and we want to sample from it. So we all know that the output of a quantum circuit is a wave function. Um, we expect it to be a, a pure state. Of course, in reality, it's gonna be mixed and it's gonna be entangled to the environment, so it's gonna have error. But in the ideal case, we're gonna have a, a pure state here. <clears throat> and the pure state is really a superposition over all the possible bit strings that you get over all your qubits. And in front of each bit string, we have this amplitude CJ. So what happens when you run this circuit? Well, the quantum computer runs the circuit, you run it many times, you get many bit strings, and each bit string is gonna show up with a particular probability. And we all know that that probability is really proportional to, to the square 
of the magnitude of this amplitude. So <clears throat> is there anything special because uh, the circuit is, is a random circuit and is really sampled from the hard measure? Well, the answer is yes. Um, once you have enough depth and enough number of qubits, uh, you are guaranteed to, with overwhelming probability, to have a typical state at the end of your, of your quantum circuit. And those states have been studied thoroughly and they, their amplitudes follow a very particular probability distribution. And actually there's a relation that is pretty nice that says the following, you take all the amplitudes and then square them. So you get all the probabilities. They're just positive numbers between zero and one. <clears throat> and now you histogram these numbers. The histogram is gonna, or the, or the probability distribution of probabilities. So the PR of probabilities where this N is just some normalization constant is gonna decay exponentially. So what that means is that this distribution is really, really flat. Exponentially, an exponential amount of bit strings are gonna have a probability close to each other. And an exponentially small set of bit strings are gonna have a probability um, larger than the rest. So <clears throat> as I said, uh, the task is gonna consist of, of sampling bit strings from the quantum computer. And then at the same time, since we wanna check the answer, we're gonna to have to simulate the circuit and classically compute these probabilities. And the fact that this is a porter thomas distribution and that it has this particular shape is good news for us because if you think about it intuitively, just an exponentially small number of bit strings are gonna have a substantial probability of showing up. And what this means is that you can actually do cross entropy between your, once you get all your bit strings from the quantum computer, you compute classically their probabilities, the probabilities of the bit strings that showed up that you actually sampled. And um, by actually, there is a larger demonstration to this, but the expression you end up with is that the fidelity of your quantum computer can be really simply uh, estimated as the expectation value of the probabilities of the bit strings that you sampled. This is called cross entropy benchmarking. There's some normalization constants, there's some constants running around, but this is basically your fidelity to a very good estimate. And there is a subtlety here. Uh, we think of, of the output of a quantum computer as a probability distribution, and we sample bit strings, and we might be able to reconstruct the probability distribution just through binning what bit strings appear and how often they appear. But really, you have to think that this experiment was made on 53 qubits. This means that the possible number of bit strings is two to the 53. And in practice, we're sampling only about a million amplitudes. So this is really many orders of magnitude lower than the number of bit strings, which means that in practice, most vast majority of the bit strings will never appear in your output. And only a few of them will appear just once. So it's really important that we can exploit this property of the circuit being Porter Thomas to to guarantee that we can compute the fidelity to high precision just through sampling very, very few bit strings from the output. A, the cross interpreting benchmarking has a lot of nice properties. One of them is that a single poly error in the circuit actually brings it down to zero. Not exactly zero to something exponentially close to zero with system size, with, with circuit size and number of qubits. So that's a property you expect. Um, and then uh, the results of the experiment, uh, and this is probably the main figure of the, of the paper on, on strong quantum advantage, is the following. So here over the y-axis, we have the fidelity of, of several quantum circuits that were run. And here we have two, two plots. The first one is called classically verifiable. The second one, supremacy regime. And what they mean is the following. So in order to be able to verify that the quantum computer is doing the right thing and verify that it did solve the problem of random circuit sampling, you have to simulate uh, what the quantum computer is doing. But then at the same time, your classical computers that are simulating the quantum circuit are gonna have a hard time keeping up. And that's, that's no joke. It's, that's really the purpose of this experiment, to have a problem that the quantum computer can solve and the classical computer cannot solve uh, easily. So how do you verify if you can even, not even compete, if you cannot even simulate? So um, this is uh, what we worked for for a couple of months, how to 
really verify that the quantum computer is doing the right thing and how to estimate the fidelity of the quantum computer in a regime where you cannot simulate it and, and you cannot even compete. So the left panel is, is really easy to understand. All the circuits are, are actually, you can compete, you can do very well with a classical computer. It doesn't scale well, but it's still in a regime where you can do it. And there is several kind, kinds of circuits. Uh, they are simplified in different ways. And all the fidelities that we increase the number of qubits that are involved in the circuits uh, decrease exponentially as is expected. You expect the fidelity to be a quantity that decreases multiplicatively with the number of gates that you apply to the qubits. Um, you can see that the fidelity is always well separated from zero. So the quantum computer is doing the right thing for a fraction of the time. Um, and that, now it's impressive that the theoretical uh, prediction of how well the quantum computer will do based on single qubit benchmarks, a uh, single gate benchmarks, um, is actually matches very well with three different estimates uh, that we took. So um, let me start from the last one. The last one is really running circuits that are not entangled. So really cutting off all the gates that entangle two halves of the chip. This makes the classical simulation really, really easy. Uh, you do cross entropy benchmarking and you estimate the fidelity. Now you have to note that just by removing the gates and entangle the two halves of the circuit, you're removing just a fraction of the gates and most of the gates are being applied. So it's no surprise that the fidelity is very close to what you would expect. Uh, but it, it really makes a point. There's some people that say that entanglement is such a fragile resource of computation um, that once you have an entangled state, the really noise is gonna be, is gonna go crazy. And what you're showing here is that no, actually there is a lot of difference in the entanglement between the different kinds of circuits and fidelity really matches every time. So the second kind is sort of an interpolation between the completely disentangled circuit and the fully entangled circuit. So here, a few gates were removed, actually most gates, but a few remained in between the two halves. And that's also classically tractable. And then here, uh, we figure out how to have full circuits with full entanglement, but rearranging a few gates so that the entanglement grows in a, in a, at a slow rate. At the end of the circuit, we have, you have full entanglement, but it decreases at a slow rate. So you can do some local optimizations in time as the circuit uh, runs deeper and deeper, and, and we, could, we were able to simulate those circuits. So we can see that interpolating from no entanglement to full entanglement, really the fidelity didn't change. Now on the right side, we have the strong quantum advantage regime. And, and here we are using the entire chip, so 53 qubits, but then we increase the number of cycles, so the depth of the circuit. And, and why is that? Well, it turns out, and I'll explain that in, in the second part of the talk, that classical simulators can play some tricks to handle a lot of qubits, but they really get killed with, uh, with depth. So they really struggle when they use these tricks uh, when, you, when you increase the depth of your circuits. So by increasing the depth, we really throw away uh, what classical simulators can do. Um, and we again see the fidelity going down exponentially as you expect uh, when you increase that depth linearly, because as you are applying more and more gates to your qubits, uh, you expect the fidelity to decrease multiplicatively. So I'm going to talk about uh, these numbers over here uh, later. Now, um, as I said, there is um, there's three kinds of circuits that we used. Uh, two of them were classically tractable. The third one was just some a matter of some trickery in order to be able to simulate it, but we removed that trickery on this side. So really the fully entangled circuits are really, really hard to simulate classically. So we are missing really the, the circle markers that we have here because those could not be verified. But all the others, the theoretical prediction of fidelity and the other two simplified circuits were benchmarked. And we again see a perfect match in between all of them. Now, in case someone in the future has such a classical computer and such an algorithm that they can simulate in this experiment with the fully, complicated and fully entangled and complicated circuits that we believe are, are pre very hard to simulate and pretty much out of reach for the classical computers. In case that happens, uh, the bit strings are, are archived. They were not verified, but they are archived and you would be able to hopefully reproduce these fidelities um, sometime in the future. So um, this is the, this figure appeared in the famous paper that came out last October and the made it to the cover of nature. 
So um, I really apologize, but uh, any question on hardware, I'll probably very likely not be able to answer. About simulations, I'll probably be able to answer a lot and about theory half and half. So I'm gonna give a very brief uh, review of the hardware, but, but really, if you have any questions, you can reach me later and I can ask uh, the people involved and you can reach directly the experimentalists. So the chip that was used here was called Sycamore. It had 53 qubits. Uh, all the qubits are arranged in a pattern that is forward compatible with surface code. And one of the plans of the, of the quantum team at Google is, is to implement the surface code in the next uh, decade or so. So they're already working on, on having that topology. And there are transponds, so there are superconducting circuits. Uh, and both the qubits and then the couplers, which are tunable, so they can change frequ resonance frequency, are transponds. And what made this experiment possible was uh, um, a set of many things that got together. So the team was able to manage several qubits uh, simultaneously. So, so you have a large number of qubits. The fidelity is good enough that you can handle large depths or large enough depths to, to, to demonstrate some quantum advantage. And really the connectivity makes a big difference. Uh, there is all nearest neighbors can talk and actually all parallel two qubit gates can, can be applied simultaneously. So this is something that, that I've been told was really hard to achieve. Um, and this actually, um, these two terms here actually talk about that. So when you benchmark gates isolated, you get some particular error rate. And then when you run them all together simultaneously, you get a different error rate that is usually higher, that is always higher. And the reason is that there is uh, some crosstalk in between, in between the gates uh, applied on different qubits. So um, uh, these kind of error rates, so three nines for one qubit gates, and two nines for two qubit gates uh, were enough to, to make the circuits grow and be complex enough for the classical computer to not be able to keep up and demonstrate strong quantum advantage. So um, this is an overview of the, of the experiment. If you have any questions now, I'll, I think I'll actually would be a good time to answer them. And if there is no question, I'll go ahead with the second part. So the second part is about simulation. So I've talked about simulations and how um, they are very important in both competing against the quantum computer and verifying that the quantum computer is doing the right thing. And this is actually the, the kind of work that I've been doing in the past, uh, you know, concerning this project. So let me repeat that. Uh, we have two competitors, the quantum computer and the classical computer, and they are both trying to perform the same task, which is sampling bit strings. And then these bit strings get verified, do they come from the right distribution? So you run cross entropy benchmarking and decide whether the quantum or the classical impersonator solve the right problem. And the classical computer comes in in, in two different uh, ways. It is a competitor against the quantum computer, and it's also a verifier. So you need to compute this uh, probability, so the amplitude squared of the bit strings that were sampled from the quantum computer in order to compute or estimate the fidelity. In both cases, you use the same or almost the same kind of simulator. You're just interested on these probabilities. On the one hand, on the on the verifier side, you need the probabilities to compute cross entropy benchmarking. On the competitor side, you need probabilities to apply some some kind of rejection sampling and really sample and look like what you're doing. Uh, so that what you're doing looks like what a quantum computer would do. So um, there is a whole plethora of simulators for quantum circuits and for quantum systems in general. And this experiment is designed to try to break all of them. So try to make it hard for all of them. They all have advantages and disadvantages, trade-offs, memory versus time, and so on. Um, the most successful simulators for random quantum circuits, so for really unstructured uh, circuits, are um, all, all code can be understood under the framework of time to networks. Uh, most of them, and even the ones that you would naively think that are not tensor networks sometimes can also be understood as tensor networks. So let me give a brief overview of why quantum circuits and tensor networks are so intimately related. And then I'll try to explain the different flavors of simulators we work with. So say you have a quantum circuit. 
In this case, uh, I've written it uh, with the circles on the left. That means that you are specifying some input. In generally, it's all qubits at zero in state zero. And I've also put the circles on the at the other side on the output. So that means that in this particular example, I care about one amplitude. So I'm specifying the input and the output. And I want to know what the matrix element of that term is. And now each of these uh, boxes, either boxes or circles, can be regarded as a tensor. And this is really fairly simple to understand. So um, each uh, gate is actually a matrix that is four by four, but you can see it actually as a, as a box uh, with four channels, two inputs and two outputs. And actually these inputs and outputs, you can specify any matrix element through specifying the four inputs and outputs. So do you want the gate element or the matrix element for 0, 1, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1, 1, or whatever. So you specify it, and that gives you a number. And that object is called a tensor. And then you can play the same game with the inputs and all the outputs. Um, maybe it's not as natural to think about it, but the important thing is that you can play the same game. And eventually what you get is this graph over here where each object does, is a tensor. And what you mean by computing the matrix element of the entire circuit for a particular input and a particular output is a very large sum. So you take all the tensors you had in your tensor network in your graph and are gonna sum over all the possibilities for each one of the ind indices, for each one of the inputs or outputs or who knows where the index is, is living. So, yeah, sorry. Frozen. So, okay, so the, this is really nice. We have a mathematical way of representing what we're doing, where we compute a matrix element of a quantum circuit. And now we try to do a classical computer and we crash because this is uh, really hard. So then we try to um, reorder the way in which we apply the sums in a particular way so that uh, the cost of our simulation or our computation of a matrix element is lower. And this is actually really true the order in which you apply the sums over different indices really matters a lot. And can give you exponential slowdowns or exponential speed ups in how you simulate your quantum circuit or how you compute these matrix elements. And actually by the same token, the last indices that you are summing over can actually help you parallelize your computation. And the reason is that everything that lives inside this bracket if you take in this example, these indices F and G outside of the bracket, it's going to be an independent sum summation. It's going to be a sub tensor network. Um, and you can compute it on completely separate processors in your supercomputer. And these indices here, you're going to have to iterate over all of them and sum the answers a posteriori. So these indices here are going to label your parallel processes that you send to each node in your, say, Blue Water, Summer, uh, Summit Supercomputer, um, you name it. So these, uh, actually, this kind of parallelization and, the, and some heuristics to optimize uh, the contraction ordering were heavily used uh, in this paper by the people at the Alibaba Group for Quantum Computing. Um, but, but really, a, it is really hard to optimize uh, what is called the contraction ordering of a tensor network. And it's actually an NP-hard problem. This was um, shown by a seminal paper by Marco and Xi in 2008, where they not only show, show this, but they actually show that quantum computers could be similar with tensor networks. Uh, just for completeness, uh, for anyone working with tensor networks, there is another operation that you usually apply that is decomposing a tensor network, a tensor into several smaller tensors. So that's a game you can also uh, play uh, here in the simulation, and that's actually we use heavily also. So what flavors of simulators uh, do you have on the market? Or at least which ones did we heavily look at? So there is a, the most naive thing you can think of that is sort of your typical Schrodinger evolution. So you take a, an initial state and you start applying gates or contracting uh, tens uh, your tensors or really summing over the indices of particular gates, a one by one in the order that is given by, by time, by the time evolution. So you apply this, and in the end, you get a full wave function, not only one matrix element, but you get many matrix, ele matrix elements um, corresponding to all the bit strings. So there is some advantages of that kind of simulator. Um, 
you can show that for deep enough circuits, this is the best you can do. Or you know, the leading term in the complexity of doing this is, is actually hitting the lower bound. Um, one very nice advantage is that you get all amplitudes at once. You don't have to compute matrix elements one by one. And there is no need for struggling, finding a good contraction ordering and fighting against this empty hard problem. Really, you know from the beginning what you're going to do, you know how you're going to contract, and you just go ahead and do it. Now, these advantages, you need to store the entire wave function, and that can be really daunting. In the case of quantum, uh, strong quantum advantage, we had 2 to the 53 uh, amplitudes, and that's, that's a lot of uh, floating point numbers. And uh, the other disadvantage is that uh, your time and memory complexity, so the time and memory resources that you need, grow exponentially with the number of qubits. Um, one advantage that I forgot to write down is that the complexity grows linearly with depth. So that's pretty nice. Now, yeah, these are the type of simulators that we're going to call uh, Feynman simulators um, that really contract the tensor network in a more exciting way. So you don't follow your typical time evolution, but you're going to contract on different ways that somehow you optimized and you know that are more efficient. And really to help us do that, we're typically going to compute a single matrix element. So we're going to specify the output and do this many times uh, per computation. The reason is that that typically decreases the complexity of the, of the contraction. So advantages of this kind of simulator. Um, it's actually the best kind of simulator as a, as a family of simulators for shallow circuits. And the reason is that you can do much better than storing the entire wave function. Um, it does much mem much better in memory, and in part, it is uh, because it's much better for, for shallow circuits. In the case of shallow circuits, uh, you can do it with, with a large advantage, but also because of the kind of parallelization that I described earlier, by parallelizing a lot of smaller subtensor networks, you're really alleviating the memory problem. And now that there's no free lunch, and that will really explode on the, on the time requirements. And a very nice thing that you can do with these kind of simulators is that you can reduce the cost of simulation when you try to mimic a quantum computer working at low fidelity. So um, there is um, a speed up, a linear speed up in the fidelity. So if you want to simulate something with fidelity 50%, you're going to take half of the time that it would take to simulate with 100% fidelity. Disadvantages. So we are computing only one matrix element at a time, one amplitude at a time. So we're going to have to compute millions of these. So we hope that they are millions of times faster than the other kind of simulators. Time and memory uh, explode also exponentially in the, um, in the size of the circuit and the number of qubits, but also on the depth. So, um, so that's something that didn't happen with the time evolution simulator. Uh, it, it only scaled linearly with the depth of the circuit. And these exponential here is in quotes just for, for correctness. It's not really an exponential. Usually it grows with the square root of the number of qubits. And, and then, as I said before, finding the best contraction ordering in order to do this in, in quotes efficiently is NP hard. So you might spend a lot of time trying to, trying to optimize this, and you might even not even succeed. And then the final uh, kind of simulator is sort of a hybrid. So um, it's going to mix uh, time evolutions, but also some exotic contractions. And by the way, uh, the reason we call this a Feynman simulator is because it resembles a lot of path integral where for a single amplitude, you're, you're competing a bunch of sums. So this kind of simulator, what it's going to do is decompose or parallelize really the indices that cross between the two halves of the circuit. So you're going to cut the circuit over here. And then you have an exponential amount of ways these circuits can talk. So for each index in, in, in the border between the two circuits, you're going to have to simulate all its possibilities. And there's an exponential number of them, exponential in depth. But then each of the halves of the circuit, you can simulate as a Schrodinger evolution. And at the end of the day, you get all the amplitudes, but you have to stitch together an exponential number of time evolutions. So, so that's why it's sort of a hybrid simulator. The advantages uh, are that it's actually best in some intermediate regime of moderate depth and large-ish number of qubits. Uh, you do, again, get all the amplitudes at once, so you don't have to repeat this millions of times for one per amplitude. It is really nice in memory. You're only simulating very few qubits per half. 
And again, you can play the game of simulating a uh, cheap lead for a low fidelity. The disadvantages, again, are the, the time of memory, of course, grow exponentially with the number of qubits, but, and, and actually with the square root of the number of qubits, and with the depth again. Okay, so these two kind of simulators actually make heavy use of the composition of gates or larger parts of the circuit. So how does simulating a, a quantum computer look in terms of the effort you have to put in? So the landscape looks sort of like this. It has two bumps and then you finish your simulation. And these two bumps mean the following. So the first bump is really figuring out what kind of contraction uh, you want to apply. What contraction ordering is going to be efficient for your contraction uh, to be doable. And this is something that applies to the finite simulator. They are the ones concerned about finding a good contraction ordering. The Schrodinger or Schrodinger Feynman, so the hybrid simulator, uh, don't care. They know a priori what they're going to do. They don't need to struggle with this first bump. And they go straight into the second with their predetermined contraction ordering. Now, the, for the Feynman simulator, the more time you spend on this first bump, the more effort you put in optimizing your contraction orderings, the smaller the second bump will be, the more optimized your contraction will be. Um, OK, so once you, you go through the two bumps, then you finish, and then you ask yourself, do I have enough amplitudes? If, so I'm sorry about this. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. So really, as I was saying, the more time you spend on the first bump, uh, you can decrease the size of the second mountain or the, or the effort you have to put in actually contracting uh, the tensor network. And, but there is really a lower bound. There is a hard core there of how, how well you can do. And this is given, given by some quantity that in graph theory is called the tree width. It's actually given by the tree width of the line graph of your tensor network. But that's just details. So you can show that for the time evolution simulator, once you have enough depth, you're always hitting the, the lower bound. So that's the preferred simulator when you have a large depth. And now, once you simulate, you ask yourself, do I have enough amplitudes for my task? If you do, um, do we need more amplitudes? If you do need more amplitudes, and that's the case for a Feynman simulator, which computes one amplitude at a time, you're going to have to iterate this second part many times until you accumulate many probabilities, many probability amplitudes. If you don't need more amplitudes, then you can go ahead and perform your task. You either simulate, uh, you either sample as a way to mimic what the quantum computer is doing and compete against it, or you perform cross entropy benchmarking and, and help estimate the fidelity of the quantum computer. Now, for the first uh, task, for the competing task, the sampling, uh, we typically follow uh, what was proposed uh, in this paper. That is, we a priori decide what amplitudes we're going to compute over a, a lot of uh, bit strings. And then we perform some kind of rejection sampling. We accept a, a bit string if the probability we computed for this bit string um, is, is, is uh, with, with a probability that goes with a minimum of one and this number. So this is a typical expression for a rejection sampling. Now the number of amplitudes you have to compute in order to accept on average one single bit string for a decent error in your sampling is about 10. So you get, if you want to sample a million bit strings, you need to compute 10 million amplitudes. And this is a large overhead. So we're going to deal with that uh, later. I'm going to show some way to alleviate this. So what kind of simulator uh, was I heavily involved in? Uh, I looked at many, and there was a whole simulation team. Um, for the last couple of years, I worked uh, heavily on this kind of simulator that we called QFlex. And, and it works in the following way. It's a kind of Feynman simulator, so it's trying to find efficient contraction orderings for our quantum circuits. Our quantum circuit in some cartoon, you know, some square grid, that is not the case for the Sycamore chip, would look like this. So you have a bunch of qubits that talk to it, its neighbors every once in a while, and you have this time direction. Um, so one particular contraction ordering that you can follow, and you save yourself the struggle of finding very exotic contraction orderings. And this works very well for shallow circuits, and it works really poorly for deep circuits, is the following. So you contract all the temporal indices first. You end up with something sort of one that looks like this, just two dimensional, and, and this, this is something called a PEPS. And then you can figure out ways to contract it efficiently, but now 
really the tensor network is very small. Yes, each tensor is very large, but the tensor network as a graph is very small, and you can compute each of the matrix elements. Um, also using the parallelization trick, where we start cutting indices and really uh, sending smaller tensor networks to different processors on your supercomputer. Once you have your matrix elements, um, you can compute either your XCB, uh, your percent of benchmarking, or you can sample and compete against the quantum uh, computer. So there's a couple uh, uh, tricks or insights we introduced in, in this first work. Uh, so we have our sampling or cross-entropy image marking machine uh, working. Uh, and then we know that we have this high overhead of needing 10 amplitudes per bit string that we want to sample. And that's a pretty bad uh, constraint when you are already struggling with your simulations. So one thing we figured out is that if you leave a few qubits, say in quotes, open. If you don't specify their output, you specify their output everywhere else, but for a few qubits, in this example, there is a six, um, you leave them open. So at the end of the day, instead of a single matrix element, you're gonna get two to the six, or two to the number of qubits that you leave open. And we call that a batch. So how does that help you uh, sample? What well, we, well, we could compute numerically is that uh, random quantum circuits scramble information so much that really the circuit loses all notion of locality. And for a shallow circuit, you can see that the, the Porter-Thomas distribution is still not converged. So the correlation in between amplitudes as we increase the Hamming distance decreases, but really the circuit knows about locality. For small Hamming distance, we get large correlation between uh, probability amplitudes. But once the circuit is converged, um, there's really no correlation. There's no notion of locality. And what that means is that we can improve our rejection sampling and do everything as we did, but then instead of computing one sample every 10 amplitudes, we can now compute one sample per batch. And, and why is this important? Well, computing a, a single batch, there is ways to figure out contraction orderings that they don't really increase your cost. You can compute to the six amplitudes for the price of a single one. And uh, given this nice property that the circuit knows nothing about locality, the circuit doesn't really care that these qubits are, are all together. So as far as you guarantee that you're sampling only one bit string per batch, because it is true that the amplitudes are not correlated, but the bit strings are, they look exactly the same everywhere, but on this set of qubits. As far as you guarantee that, that every batch, you only take one amplitude that passes uh, the rejection sampling test, then, then you're gonna get a bit string. So you really decrease the simulation cost by a factor of 10 by an order of magnitude. Another thing we explored, and this was based on, on previous work, is, is the low fidelity sampling. So it turns out that if you sample correctly a fraction f, so where f is fidelity of the time, you're going to have a sampling that really mimics a quantum computer sampling at fidelity f. So you get a, a linear speed up with, with low fidelity. Um, we figured out an alternative way to, to do this, but really the first uh, proposal of, of getting this linear speed up was given in this paper. And uh, then on a second work, uh, we implemented this algorithm on GPUs. We benchmarked the largest supercomputer in the world, which is called Summit. We could run up to circuits of up to 121 qubits with the caveat that they were shallow circuits. Not super shallow, they have, have a few uh, levels of a few layers of gates, but pretty shallow. Another nice, nice thing about this work is that we could benchmark the efficiency of, of our linear algebra packages that we were using. Uh, some of them tailored for this project, we could get very high efficiency over the entire supercomputer. So um, let me go again, uh, and I should be very close to, to the end. Let me go again to the, to the final result of the strong quantum advantage experiment, uh, where we saw that fidelity um, can be computed for very fast circuits, but then for, for, for what we call supremacy circuits, uh, it could not be computed because the classical computer would struggle too much. So, and then we gave these estimates of time that it would take to simulate a quantum computer in order to perform, perform the same kind of task. Uh, these numbers actually come from the schwinger feynman simulator. We gave up on the just time evolution simulator because storing a wave function of two to the 53 qubits is really something that does not fit in the realm of any supercomputer in the world. 
and there will be an update on that in a couple minutes. Um, and then the, the experiment was really designed to break the sort of Feynman simulators. It, it really goes to the high depths where they really perform poorly. So eventually we used the Schrenger Feynman simulator. And we did uh, mention in the, in the paper that simulation methods have improved a lot in the last few years. And we expand them to keep improving. So simulation costs get uh, uh, much lower and classical hardware to get uh, much better. But at the same time, uh, we expect the quantum computers to get better and keep outpacing classical computers in this fundamentally hard problem for classical computers. So, so what are the follow-ups? What, what is the aftermath of the experiment? Well, actually many exciting works. So first, this really appeared on the media, had an impact. So the people at IBM said, okay, uh, you guys have simulated something that is really hard for classical computers, but it's actually not impossible. And the reason is that even though you cannot fit the entire wave function in order to perform a, a, a time evolution simulation on the RAM of the largest supercomputer in the world, uh, you can store it on disk. On, on disk that is designed for, for long-term storage or sometimes to aid you with some algorithms. Uh, and this is, um, this is a solution we, we didn't look into enough. And the reason is that communication is, is really poor in between the, the RAM and the disk on the supercomputer. But they really did a great job in figuring out how to reduce communication to a minimum. And they put the simulation costs for the largest uh, circuits we, we run on, on the order of, of days. The lower bound is about two, uh, two and a half days probably be a bit larger uh, because of non-ideal conditions. Another uh, really exciting work that appeared uh, four months ago is this work by Johnny Gray. So he's a person that has developed uh, a very nice software for tensor contraction. And here he really figured out a way to alleviate the cost of optimizing the contraction ordering of a tensor network. So if you remember this kind of landscape where we have two bumps, the first bump being uh, well, the effort we need to put into finding a good contraction ordering so that the second bump is not that bad. He really, with, with heuristics, at least for the case of, of these random quantum circuits, could decrease the cost by a lot. He could get with heuristics something that is close to optimal contraction orderings. Um, that kind of simulation, if you bring it to its ultimate results on the largest supercomputer of the world, is of the order of a couple of weeks or three weeks to simulate the, the largest uh, circuits. And then a very nice um, work that, that appeared that is by a, by a student of Edward Solomonic and, and she did it with people at the Fatar Institute is, is something completely different. It opens a completely different tab. And it answers the question, uh, what happens if you really try to, um, to simulate quantum computers with your tools that you've been using for your with your classical simulation tools of quantum physics, and in particular with matrix product states that we use all the time in condensed matter. Uh, accepting that your gates will not be perfect, accepting a, a little error every time you apply a gate. And what they found is that for, what was surprising is that for really, really high fidelity per gate, something really close to what the quantum computer is doing, they get a linear cost in their simulation. And now this has, Akabayat, and, and the, um, the reason is that this is true in one dimensions and the uh, sycamore chip, of course, in order to, um, to break all the kind of, of, of simulators uh, is, is using a two dimensional graph and with high connectivity. So this doesn't really apply, but it's a, it opens a really nice world of exploration in, uh, in, on the classical side. Like what happens if you really ally, allow errors in your gates? So, um, so how hard are our simulations then? So our original estimate was some years and the supplement, we, we mentioned some tricks that we believe would bring it down to about a, a hundred years. And then the, all these works bring it down to weeks or days. Uh, this is still orders of magnitude larger than, than what the quantum computer took. That was 200 seconds. And I believe uh, these estimates are close to the lower bound for current hardware, but simulations can be proven and, and you can never tell. Uh, there is a second um, point to make and is that these simulations are really using the largest possible supercomputer in the world, which consumes 10 megawatts uh, of power. 
And this is in contrast with 10 kilowatts for the quantum computer for the Sycamore chip and a refrigerator and, and everything. So there is really a, even a larger advantage in terms of energy, not only a three orders of magnitude in between the power they consume, but also multiplied by the orders of magnitude of, of advantage in the time. So this is something we expected, the classical computers to keep improving, but you have to keep in mind that, that the quantum computer is doing better and better, and we can probably uh, dive more into the strong quantum advantage uh, regime. So what's next? Uh, exciting things are happening next. So, um, of course, there's a long-term uh, goal of error correction and achieving fully scalable quantum computation that's, that needs many years, many decades. Uh, and then there is the near-term goals of uh, which this experiment sort of is a stepping stone for. It sort of unlocks a new algorithmic area where you cannot, that you cannot explore with classical computers and that you can only explore with a high fidelity, high enough fidelity machine. So it really opens the, the box for exploration in near-term applications and hopefully there is useful strong quantum advantage uh, in some problems like optimization, quantum chemistry, and um, or, or other things that we might find on the way. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is that uh, the strong quantum advantage experiment can be seen as a hello world experiment for quantum computers. So when you learn a programming language, the first program you write is a hello world is not useful, but it shows that the, quantum, that the computer is working and that you know how to code at least uh, something grammatically correct. So um, for quantum computers really saying hello in a new world of algorithms that you can barely explore with classical computers is really some kind of a hello world uh, application. So thank you very much for, for your attention and I'll be happy to try to answer questions. Thanks for the talk, Benjamin. Um, that was quite interesting. So uh, are there questions? Feel free to uh, just speak up or post in the chat if we get a little bit of a queue. So I see Edgar is talking, but I cannot hear anything. Can you hear me now? Or no? I'm not sure if it's just me or, or everybody, but I cannot yeah, hear. Yeah, I can anything. hear Edgar, so I'm not sure what's wrong. Okay, so maybe it was just some kind of lag. That... Okay, so let me take a look at the chat and maybe that that works better. You can all hear. So I think it may be your volume. Okay, awesome. Now I can see the chat. Yeah, I have volume one, so I'll 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 try to just read the chat and 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 answer. I guess one just clarifying questions I had is when you talk about the number of cycles uh, in the plot you have here on the bottom right, that's the depth, right? And in turn, or, or was was that mistaken? Oh, I see. You can't. Yes, so the number of cycles is is proportional to the depth. So depth uh, really depends a lot on, on how you place your gates, but a cycle for this experiment was a layer of two qubit gates, putting two qubit gates on all, all possible qubits. Of course, you cannot re repeat a, a qubit with two qubit gates at the same time. And then a, one, a layer of one qubit gates. So this combination of two and one qubit gates is a cycle. And, and the largest uh, circuits will run over 20 cycles. Okay, thanks. Other questions? And yeah, we should put them in the chat. Okay, so um, yeah, we are done. So hour. yeah, I'm really sorry for not being able to hear everybody. I don't know why this is happening, but uh, I'll wait a couple of minutes to see if there is another question.
Okay, so if there is no question, um, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say goodbye. Thanks for your attention. Uh, I'll wait 30 seconds to see if something pops up, but otherwise I'll, I'll disconnect. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Mehman. Uh, I, I think that was a great talk. Uh, we are at the end of the hour, so we should thanks. stop. Uh, uh, hope to see you all uh, next week. Okay.